wait, there we go. Okay. All right, I'm out here at uh, Grant Bright Cruises uh, by Redwood Falls. Uh, today, Grant was kind enough to let a bunch of us out to roam his fields uh, and learn a little bit about his practices that are kind of unconventional. Um, he's following some methods uh, called regenerative agriculture. Um, and I guess it's, it's, it's quite a different approach. Um, maybe you could help us understand it a little bit better. What, what does regenerative agriculture mean? I guess to me the simplest way to put it is regenerative agriculture is fixing and improving Grandpa. what we've screwed up in the Grandpa. past. <laughs> Hi, Elsie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, granddaughters got home. No, it's, it's to me it's uh, it's fixing it's fixing what we've done for the last 100, 150 years in agriculture. To me, is what regenerative is when we can see life come back to the soil, wildlife back on the land, healthy cattle, healthy crops. To me, that's what regenerative is. What's the problem? I and mean, why can't we just keep uh, planting corn and soybeans and putting fertilizer down? Um, the push, the push in agriculture right now, the way I see it, is soil is just a medium to hold the plant up, and that we have to put every other thing in there to make that plant grow and yield synthetically. And on this farm, we've proven that to be the exact opposite. So you're saying you don't use fertilizer? We use some fertilizer, but we use about 30% of what we used to, to grow a crop. And you're doing... Uh, so today we learned about the five principles of soil health. Um, and you might have to help me out with this. Uh, minimum disturbance. That's the first one, right? There it is again. This place is horrible. This place is horrible. <laughs> okay, so we had minimum disturbance, armoring the surface of the soil to pr protect it from wind and water erosion. Yep. And then what's Heat from the sun. Heat from the sun. Increased diversity. Increased diversity. That one seems kind of vague. What's that mean? Well, in a corn soybean rotation, why don't we introduce something in between the corn rows? More diversity. Okay, so you're talking cover crops now. So that also helps with the two you just covered, armor. Okay. Okay, so that's where we get our armor too, from the co those cover crops. Yep. Um, what's the fourth one? Guys in the back, help us know. I'm gonna make him struggle a little bit. Okay, so we've got diversity. Yep. Minimum disturbance. Yep. Um, armor. We've got armor. Um, I know what the last one is. But it's the fourth one. We need living roots in the living soil. Living roots in the soil. As long as we possibly can. Now, why is that? There's many, many reasons. This could take hours. <laughs> so just to make it simple, living root in the soil is just helping to feed the biology in the soil all the time. And I don't know if we got through it today before you guys got here, but so what you saw here was aggregates. You know, the university people were showing you aggregates, the structure in the soil. And they, I didn't hear them say it down there either, but an aggregate in the soil will only last 28 days without a living root there feeding it, helping it stay a structure. It has to have living biology, living root there to keep the aggregate structure there. So that's why we want that living root in the soil as long as possible. It sounds like there's a lot of research just coming out about these billions of organisms that are living in the soil and actually interacting with the plants yeah, to yeah. supply the nutrients. In healthy soil, basically in a thimble, a thimble of healthy soil, there's more biology, more measurable life in there than there are people on this earth. In a thimble. In a thimble. Wow. And the last one uh, is integrating livestock, which when I first started learning about this stuff, I thought, well, that's the toughest, probably not worth the effort. But what's what have you found out here? Well, we we're, were blessed. We had a cow herd here already. But for somebody that doesn't have a cow herd, you don't have to own the cows. There's all kinds of people looking for places to put cows, you know, figure out a good working agreement, get that livestock to your, to your land. What and comes out of that back of, back of the cow cannot be duplicated in a lab anyway, anyhow. And what we've learned here on our farm is when we run those cows across there, we can improve soils about three times faster than we can with the cow. 
I'm not saying you have to have the cow because I've got neighbors that are changing their operations immensely. David Brant's perfect, perfect history with there. You know, he started no till in 1970, cover crops in 78, never had livestock on there. He's got his own soil type. Did it take him a long time? Yeah, but he did it. It can be done without livestock, but there's livestock around, livestock can be moved. I saw a slide today, uh, Kent Solberg at SFA was showing us um, about the, the NPK that cattle leave behind in a field. It was remarkable, uh, the rates of NPK that cattle leave behind. So it's actually, you know, what, what's one of our biggest inputs in cropland? NPK. NPK, so. And microbes. I don't think Kent had anything on micros. I haven't seen many studies on that. But the biology that comes out of that cow can't be duplicated. But this sounds really expensive. It's got to take five, ten years to, to see a profit or anything to transition to this. You know, I don't really know how to answer that. But if I'll just say it this way, plain and simple. About 12 years ago, Don and I were thinking about quitting farming because it wasn't fun anymore. We weren't making any money. Farming's fun again. That's farming it. this way is just a blast. I mean, every day, Gabe Brown says it. Every day he used to get up in the morning and wonder what he was going to kill. Now we get up in the morning and it's like, what are we going to plant? What are we going to try here? What are we? What, what kind of life are we going to try to encourage in this farming ranch? How many acres are we running? <clears throat> oh, we got about a thousand acres of row crop and uh, about 700 acres of a lot of our pasture is pretty heavy wooded here. We're along the Minnesota River, so it's not fair open open land. Here. And it's, a, it's about changing from a mindset of production to a mindset of what you're netting to yeah. profit. Yeah, Gabe, early on, we were still pushing production, production, production. I mean, our banks tell us we got to have production. Our crop insurance tells us we got to have production. Everything tells us we got to have production. But when you finally switch your mindset and look at profit per acre, we don't all have to be the county corn growing champion. But when corn, I mean, it's not that many years ago, we had neighbors here, the highest price we had in town locally was $3.59 a bushel for corn that year. My cost of production on my corn, after it's all in the bin, measured, everything's accounted for, use an average county land rent, because that can be different in everybody's operations, so we use the same land rent than everybody else. Our cost of production is $2.59 a bushel. Will I ever get to Gabe Brown in some of his presentations? He shows a buck forty. I'll never get there because we're in Minnesota. Our land cost is too high. He can rent land for thirty to fifty bucks an acre. We'll never get down to his level. But can we take a buck a bushel off of it? Yes, we can. And and it does take time. You cannot. You cannot go from what I would call conventional agriculture, corn soybean rotation with high synthetic inputs and switch to what we're doing one year, it'll be a massive flipper. These soils are addictive to what, addictive to what we've been doing for the last 50 years. They need to be weaned off. I mean, in reality, you asked before about how long about profitability. I would say how long about seeing massive changes in soil health, three to five years, because you gotta wean the system back down. You have to have a successful cover crop. You know, when we were extremely wet, we were struggling to get successful cover crops because we couldn't get them in on time, it was wet, it was cold. You know, those those hurt us, and we had to add more synthetics to grow a crop. Now, we got good weather, well, now we're too dry, but. So this has been a process for you guys to figure out, um, kind of started about 12 years ago? Nah, closer to 15 now. What are some of the immediate things you started to see? Um, you talked a bit earlier about earthworms, uh, any other wildlife? Uh, so when Don and I started down this path, the earthworm was our one, number one predictor that we were on the right path and going the right way. It was the simplest thing there was. Um, there's been a lot of testing that's come out now um, that I trust. At that time, I didn't trust anybody's soil test. <clears throat> so the biggest thing we watched was earthworm population. And we figured out that after a small grain crop with a successful cover crop with well-managed grazing of the cows in the winter late fall going through there we could quadruple to 10 times the amount of earthworm in a cubic foot of soil in 12 months wow and those are organisms that are just working for you to digest that residue and create a new
nutrient-dense topsoil layer. Absolutely, but they're the ones that are quickest and easiest for us as human beings to see with an eye without a microscope. Or That's how you see results. Yeah, it's and then quick and easy. You've seen birds, you've seen <clears throat> di more diverse insects now that you're using less pesticides. Um, it was really cool to hear the story about the not great for you, that huge herd of deer that completely uh, yeah. over that field, but left fertilizer for you. Um, it was pretty exciting to hear how you created this whole ecosystem yeah. right here on your farm. And I can't imagine what that would do for so many but, farms. But that's the one thing that the profit per acre and realizing that we are managing an ecosystem, that's huge because, okay, if if we're going to go and spray for a pest and insect that's causing this problem, we kill 17 to 1900 pound fish. Wow. Now, why don't we just figure out the way to manage that insect that's causing this problem? Is it changing crop rotation? Is it a different cover crop? Different species in the cover crop? Whatever it is, let's try to figure out why that pest is there instead of destroying that and 1700 of its bodies. That's that's what's really changed. We haven't sprayed soybean aphids here in nine years. And we, we how often use herbicides? We still use herbicides, but we're on on an average year we're down to about thirty to sometimes as high as sixty percent of what we used to be on herbicide use. Wow. Well, I, I'm really excited about what you're doing. I watched your documentary with Don, um, Farmer's Footprint. It's really I think it gets to the core of why people, farmers, should be looking at this. I mean, with the amount of farms that are being lost to institutional funds and overseas investors, and what this all means for our climate and for our health, it's pretty exciting uh, if we can get more people on board. And there's a lot going on right now um, with understanding egg. So if folks want to learn more, uh, definitely check out Farmer's Footprint. That's a great documentary, 20 minute documentary. Just search it on YouTube and then uh, understandingegg.com. They've got a lot of great resources. Uh, SFA, the Sustainable Farming Association, Lululemon, Minnesota Health Coalition.